Lifting Up Jesus, Opening His Word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. reality that many born-again believers take on the ideas of people whose theology is extremely dodgy, unscriptural, even bordering on the heretical and sometimes even apostate. Peter Ruckman was not the only one. For instance, most pre- tribulational dispensationalists in the United States don't really know about Cyrus Schofield, the American protege of John Nelson Darby. Schofield was a forger and an embezzler. He had no theological training. His background was as a lawyer and a politician. But he wound up going to federal prison criminally convicted of embezzlement. He was a known drunkard who abandoned his wife and children. He actually abandoned his family and defrauded his wife's family. He went to prison as a swindler. This is Schofield, the man who propagated pre-tribulationism in the United States and pre-tribulational dispensationalism in the USA. His British mentor, John Nelson Darby. John Nelson Darby was somebody who said the epistle of James was not written for the church, it's for unbelieving Jews. That the Sermon on the Mount was largely written, not for Christians, but for unbelieving Jews. And he did the same thing with the Olivet Discourse, with Matthew 24 and so forth. Most people who are pre-tribulational don't know that Darby had the, those, those kinds of hermeneutics, which we've mentioned on other recordings. They don't know that the major evangelical leaders of the day didn't like him including many of the founders of the early brethren, such as James Grant and Benjamin Newton and Dr. Samuel Tregalis, but they have no idea that people like Charles Spurgeon warned against him publicly with newspaper ads, and, and D.L. Moody, and, and George Mueller. They all denounced him as a despot. He was a cult leader. He was the founder of a cult. People have no idea that he, was a, that he tried to combine dispensational ideas with ultra-Calvinist ideas sprinkling infants. People don't know what Schofield and Darby believed. Well, the same thing is true today, not only about pre-tribulationists, that they're getting their doctrine from some extremely precarious people, whose ideas would probably shock them, and they certainly, many people who are pre-tribulational, would not agree that the Epistle of James is not for the Church, and that the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, yet that's where they're getting their end-time prophetic teaching, their eschatology, and so forth. Well, let's continue. This is even more true, or at least co-equally as true, concerning Ruckmanism. Ruckmanism is better known as King James Version Onlyism. The two biggest proponents of KJV Onlyism, Peter Ruckman, and Gail Ripplinger are both proven frauds, both charlatans. I'll take Miss Ripplinger first. When she was interviewed by Wayne House, it was disclosed, it was exposed that she couldn't read Greek or Hebrew. She couldn't even read the original languages. That her degree is in home economics. That her master's thesis or something was about cost-efficient laundry detergents or something. Nothing to do with scripture. The woman had no background or basis on what she was doing whatsoever. None. 
Now when the Lord needed somebody to deal with scholarly issues or theology, he would raise up people like Apollos or Paul who had the background to do it. Jesus said, I will raise up for you scribes, scholars, theologians. That's what Jesus said. Well, Gail yeah, Ripplinger was none of those things. She was an expert on detergent. And she wrote this ridiculous book called New Age Versions, which is conspiracy theory nonsense. And she was claiming a mystical guidance in writing the book that very closely resembles what you see in mystical Judaism, Kabbalah. These things are demonic. Now, this is not to deny biblical typology or the use of gematria in, 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 in the scriptures. That those things are there or acrostics. But she didn't know anything about gematria or acrostics. She didn't even know Greek or Hebrew in order to know those things. She was just a fraud. The woman is a complete and utter fraud. And although her, her ideas were embraced by various conspiracy theorists from the lunatic fringe, pretending to be discernment ministries, people like Barbara Aho and uh, Victoria Dillon, these crazy people went with these beliefs and began propagating them to ignorant people largely, Ripplinger was a fraud. Tell her I said so. I'll debate her anywhere. Ruckman, however, was more dangerous. He was a quasi-learned man. He was not the great scholar his father was pretended he was, but he was not an theologically unlearned in the way or to the degree that Gail Ripplinger is. What Ruckman said was the following. Additions to the 1611 edition of the King James Bible, not found in the original manuscripts, or even found in the Textus Receptus, are further revelation. Now the last thing Jesus said was a caveat against adding anything to the canon of Scripture at the end of the book of Revelation. We read the same thing in Proverbs, and we read the same thing in the Torah, that Moses said, do not add to his word, you'll be proved the liars, as in Proverbs. But Ruckman actually argued that contents found in the 1611 edition of the King James Bible, which was a translation of a translation, are further revelation. In other words, the canon of Scripture did not end with the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. This is what Ruckman taught. This is blatantly, blatantly heretical. He made a schism based on a false doctrine. The second feature of Ruckmanism was in the area of lingual priority. As we pointed out many times, there is only one verse in Scripture that in its exegetical context speaks of the issue of translation. It is in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, when the people returned from the Babylonian captivity, as had been predicted by Daniel and Jeremiah. They could not read their mother tongue anymore, Hebrew. Only the Levites and some older people knew Hebrew. The others spoke Chaldee. They spoke a dialect of what became known as Aramaic. In Nehemiah chapter 8, 8, we read, and they read from the book from the law of God, that is the Megillah Torah, the Pentateuch, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. That's the only verse in Scripture, as we pointed out before, that deals with the issue of translation. The priority is always on the original meaning of the original languages in the original autographs. It's something only found one place in Scripture. God did not see any need to state it more than once. The priority is the original meaning of the original languages and the original autographs. God did not give his word through post-Elizabethan English in the 17th century. Now let me point out, I have a very high regard for the legacy and history of people who God used like John Wycliffe. I have a very high regard for people who God used like William Tyndale. And I have a high regard for the King James Bible, but it's not without its errors. 
We've discussed this before. <coughs> Jesus did not raise on Easter. The Holy Spirit is not an it. There are definite mistakes in the King James Bible in both Testaments. While it claims to come directly from the Texas Receptus in the New Testament, I can show you places where it deviates from the Texas Receptus. The Texas Receptus itself was four earlier Byzantine manuscripts fused together by Erasmus of Rotterdam. It's not a source manuscript. It also deviates from the Masoretic Hebrew text in a number of key places. The King James is a literary masterpiece. God has used it tremendously, but it is a translation of a translation, and God did not give his word, and again, in 17th century English. King James himself leaves much to be desired as a historical figure. Remember, the pilgrims came on the Mayflower because he was persecuting them. He persecuted born-again Christians. His mother was the Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots. In his King James Bible, in his original authorized version, he included Roman Catholic Holy Days to Mary and quoted the apocryphal texts as if they were canonical. Now again, I'm not denigrating the King James or those who read it, or denying that God has blessed it and used it, and I certainly respect some of the underlying texts that it draws from, certainly those of the early reformers who were persecuted in England, and certainly William Tyndale. However, and, 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 and I respect the legacy of Mr. Coverdale, however, Coverdale and Tyndale, deserving the honor that they received in church history, they're great saints of God. But King James himself was no great saint of God. Most historians think he was a homosexual who had this fondness for this young man. I mean, it was almost accepted. If one was to read the history of the English-speaking people by Sir Winston Churchill, what Churchill says of, of King James is, is, is absolutely grueling. <laughs> Yet, this was Ruckman's primary text. He gave it the priority over the original Greek and Hebrew. Ruckman was a man who had serious issues, moral and ethical. From the pulpit, from the pulpit, he would refer to black people as niggers. He actually said that in church, from the pulpit. A racist. Speaking about Elvis Presley, he said, now look at Elvis Presley. First he began to sing like a nigger, then he began to dance like a nigger. Those were his exact words. Preaching it. This man had serious problems. And anybody who'd lend much credibility to somebody like that has serious problems. I listened to one of Peter Ruckman's tapes on divorce and remarriage with good reason. He was married three times. Divorced, married, divorced, married. <laughs> three times. And on the purpose of his teaching on the issue, he begins by stating, at no time will I appeal to the original Greek or Hebrew text for the simple reason that anybody who goes into error does so when they deviate from the King James Version. Well, concerning the issue of divorce and remarriage, with himself being divorced and remarried multiple times, he, circumlo he circumlocuted the entire subject. He spoke round and round and wouldn't deal with it. He wouldn't deal with what the original text said. It was hideous. It was hideous. The man was a false teacher. The man was obviously some kind of a bigot. The man had moral issues concerning marriage and divorce in his own life multiple times. But the man had views that he espoused that directly contradicted the final warning of Jesus not to add anything to Scripture. He actually claimed additions to the 1611 edition of the King James Bible were further revelation beyond what the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles and Hebrew prophets to write. He was not a positive figure. He was a very negative figure who did tremendous damage. 
just like people who are pre-tribulational don't want to face the truth, the irrefutable truth about John Nelson Darby or about Cyrus Schofield. Neither do the King James only people generally want to confront the irrefutable truth about either Gail Ripplinger or about Peter Ruckman. The one not his judge, God is. Whether he was a Christian or not, I don't know. I know he was a racist. I know he was a heretic. I know he had moral issues in his life, serious ones. Remaining in the ministry as a divorced and remarried man, then divorced and remarried again and then again. I don't know. I can't judge him. I can only judge his actions and his doctrine. Peter Ruckman was a false teacher and a dangerous man who did tremendous damage to the body of Christ. I wish to underscore the fact, however, that this is in no way to denigrate the King James Bible or those who read it. It is a valid translation. It is certainly superior to many modern translations, particularly the inclusivist ones, and some of the paraphrases, or the pseudo-Bibles, like Eugene Peterson's The Message. King James is better than that, despite its archaic language. Now, it has its problems. People don't speak that way anymore, and it's complicating the Word of God. When John Wycliffe put his Bible into English, it was so the ordinary people could hear it. Same reason as the apostles wrote in Koine Greek instead of classic Attic Greek or in Hebrew or Aramaic. They wanted the ordinary people to have the lingua franca. That was the apostolic example. That was certainly the example of John Wycliffe, whose beliefs and actions precipitated the Reformation by generations. Huss was well, 100 years before Luther. But Wycliffe was before Huss, and Huss's whole, uh, uh, Wycliffe's whole idea was to put the Bible in the language people can understand it. The King James takes the Word of God and puts it back into 17th century English. That is the main problem I have with it, apart from the fact that there's mistakes. But devotionally, I read it myself, and it's wonderful for its prose, and it's certainly better than a modern paraphrase or an inclusivist Bible. I'm not attacking it. I'm not denying God has used it. I'm not in any way making any statements critical of people who read it. And there are credible people who have a view of the King James that although I would not completely share it, they're not like Ruckman or Ripplinger. There's something called the Trinitarian Bible Society, but their focus on the King James in the English language is not so much on the King James itself, but their desire to preserve the Trinity against other Bible versions that they think downplay it or may indeed downplay it. I'm not saying all people who have a strong view of the King James are like Ripplinger or like Ruckman. But Ripplinger's a fraud. And Peter Ruckman was a false teacher. He was a racist. He was maritally immoral. And he had ideas that were nothing short of heretical. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for the question.